Wenda Doff was born in 1977 in the Netherlands and later studied and worked as a researcher at several Dutch universities, including Erasmus University in Rotterdam. She completed a PhD in sociology from the Netherlands Graduate School of Housing and Urban Research in 2005, with her dissertation published in Dutch in that year. This article, published two years later after she had moved to the Technical University of Delft, continues her interest in studying residential patterns as evidence of social relationships between ethnic groups. She dropped the Buma from her name after 2009 and, ha and has been simply Wenda Doff since then. This article is important because it shows us yet another way that ethnicity can be defined and used to form social groups, basing identity on national origin and language. She also presents us with a useful research design that looks at not only whether ethnic residential segregation exists, but whether it can be explained as the result of voluntary self-selection of ethnic immigrants into their own ethnic neighborhoods. Starting in the last few decades of the 20th century, immigrants began to move into the Netherlands from many other parts of the world. A lot of this migration can be traced back to the colonial period in the 19th and early 20th centuries when there were Dutch colonies in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Indonesia, and other parts of the world. The ties between the Netherlands and these former colonies stimulated the flow of immigrants. As their numbers increased, so did social tensions and resulting residential segregation from the native-born Dutch population. There have been a lot of very public debates about this issue in the Dutch mass media and political movements for and against such segregation. Bumadoff mentions one of the common opinions about ethnic segregation of immigrants in the Netherlands, that this segregation is voluntary self-selection based on shared interests and a desire for a sense of community with people from one's own cultural background. The Dutch expression is soort zoek soort, or as Bumadoff translated, birds of a feather flock together. She wrote this article to test whether such an explanation fits the facts of everyday life in Dutch cities. Illustrating the extent of the segregation problem, she shows us a table with numbers measuring residential concentration by ethnicity in the four largest cities in the Netherlands. These numbers represent our old friend the index of dissimilarity again, so each value in the table shows the share of that ethnic group that would have to relocate to a different area within the city in order to have the same distribution across the city as the native-born Dutch population there. Groups from the Middle East and North Africa, Turks and Moroccans, are the most segregated, while the groups from the Caribbean and coastal South America, Antillians and Surinamese, are slightly less segregated from the native Dutch in these cities. This level of ethnic segregation certainly seems to call for some kind of explanation. She cites a number of writers who subscribe to the voluntary self-segregation idea, and we also have seen this same idea put forward to explain the separation of Protestants from Catholics in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Bumadoff also raises some objections to this self-segregation explanation. She points to studies of racial segregation in other countries especially to the large body of research about black-white segregation in the United States. Such studies have documented larger structural forces in society that contribute to ethnic segregation as a residential outcome. One of the most well-known involved the policy of redlining by banks and other mortgage lenders who identified what they called high-risk areas in cities where they chose not to make loans to people. These areas generally had high concentrations of ethnic minorities, as well as being poorer parts of the city. For the first half of the 20th century, it was even legal to write racial exclusion clauses directly into contracts of sale for houses, by which buyers agreed not to sell the house to minorities in the future. After this practice was outlawed by the courts, real estate agencies and banks continued to find new ways to split up the residential market by race and to maintain the segregated character of cities. Such segregation might be seen as deliberate and voluntary, but the agents who were voluntarily segregating the city were institutional actors, not the minority residents themselves. So we have at least some grounds to be skeptical of the self-segregation hypothesis, 
and that is all Bumadoff needs to get busy with her research. She develops a research plan with several steps or stages. First, she will find out how much ethnic segregation actually exists in these Dutch cities. That is what she showed us with the first table we've already examined. Second, she will find out how much of this segregation might be due to other factors that also produce segregation, quite separately from any consideration of ethnic identities. If the different ethnic groups also are different in terms of such other segregation-producing factors, there might not be any actual ethnic effect at all. We will consider what she discovers about this in the second part of the lecture. Finally, she will find out whether the segregation that may exist, unexplained by other factors, can be explained by preferences and voluntary choices of the different ethnic populations themselves. We will see what she discovers about this self-segregation argument in the third part of the lecture. But even before we go on to such issues, it is worth pointing out the basic logic that she will follow in order to test that idea. Her approach is very simple. She will look at self-reported measures of residential preferences for the different immigrant groups captured by their responses to sample surveys and compare those results to the way they actually live. If their living arrangements match their self-reported preferences, then she will judge such segregation to be voluntary self-segregation. If their living arrangements do not match their self-reported preferences, she will judge such segregation to be involuntary forced segregation, which makes it a social problem calling for public discussion and perhaps even public policies. Test any of her ideas, Bumadoff needs to find some empirical evidence about characteristics of immigrant populations in the Netherlands so she could compare the social and economic makeup of these groups to the native-born Dutch population. She settled on two surveys to supply this information. For the immigrants, she used a 2002 survey whose title translates to Immigrant Social Position and Use of Services. These interviews with immigrants included a lot of information about detailed social characteristics. To compare the immigrant groups to the native-born Dutch, she got hold of the Netherlands Kinship Panel Study survey dataset, which provided her with all the same kinds of measures for the native-born population of cities in the Netherlands. So what kind of characteristics did she think might explain observed residential segregation, quite apart from ethnicity of immigrants? There's already a very large research literature showing that people tend to be segregated from each other, to some extent in contemporary cities, based on a number of other factors. For example, because some neighborhoods were built at different times from others, the people who moved into one neighborhood at one point in time will tend to grow old there together, while people moving into a newer area will tend to be younger on average. Even when the older people in a neighborhood begin to get too old to continue living there, they tend to sell off their houses in a sort of age-linked wave so that the new crop of residents begin to repeat the same pattern all over again to some extent. This also means that some neighborhoods will have a lot of children at one point in time, but maybe very few later, and that this local concentration of children will shift around across the city as these processes unfold. The fact that houses in a neighborhood often are of a similar size and price also means that people will tend to concentrate in these neighborhoods on the basis of how much they can afford to pay for housing. Plenty of research shows us clearly that differences in education and income are linked to residential outcomes so that different areas of the city tend to have white-collar or blue-collar neighborhoods and more educated or less educated residents. In other words, birds of a feather flock together on the basis of all these other factors, such as age, stage of the family cycle, education, and income, as well as possibly on the basis of shared ethnicity. If one particular group of immigrants who shared such an ethnic identity also happened to share similar characteristics in terms of these other factors, it might well be that only this other kind of sorting out is actually happening. Wenda Bumadoff knows that before she can talk about any specifically ethnic segregation, she first has to rule out these other possible explanations. So we might say that her first null hypothesis, which she has to disprove before she can move on to study ethnicity itself, would assume that there is actually no such ethnic segregation, 
once we look within categories of rich and poor, young and old, educated and uneducated, single and married, parents and non-parents, and so on. She has to compare apples to apples in this sense, so that any residential segregation she tries to explain can't be accounted for by these other factors. Using the data from a 2002 Dutch housing demand survey, then, she creates a model that explains the concentration of people in certain neighborhoods using these controls to predict where they will live. She fits this model to the native-born Dutch population to find out how these other factors will concentrate even the Dutch themselves in poorer neighborhoods when they have less education and income, and the like. After all, these other factors sort out even the native-born Dutch and put them in different neighborhoods based on their age, family status, education, and income. Then she takes this pattern of sorting out by the other factors that she observes for the native-born Dutch and applies it to the immigrant populations, also sorted out by the same factors. So if the least educated Dutch are likely to show up in certain neighborhoods, she assumes that the least educated people in each immigrant group should have exactly the same chance to wind up in the same neighborhoods. If more of the immigrants fall into that least educated category, more of them will show up in the neighborhood, but that will be due to their education, not to their ethnic identity. This statistical model produces predicted shares of each immigrant group that should appear living in different neighborhoods of the cities in the Netherlands. If these predicted shares match the actual shares of these groups found there, then we have nothing left to explain. Their residential distribution would be purely a matter of these other characteristics, not of their ethnicity as a separate factor. On the other hand, if those predicted residential concentrations are not the same as what we actually observe, then we, then we very well might be able to claim that such differences measure an actual ethnic segregation effect independently of all these other possible effects. When we look at figure one in her article, we can see clearly that the amount of ethnic segregation or concentration that we might expect based only on the immigrant's lower education or income or differences in family circumstances falls far short of the actual ethnic concentration observed in the Netherlands. The native Dutch obviously are just about where they're predicted to be since their residential patterns served as the template for predicting the other groups. But the expected concentration of these other groups in such neighborhoods, given only their other social characteristics, would not have been that much higher than that observed or expected for the Dutch themselves. In contrast, the actual observed concentration of all four ethnic populations is much higher than what was predicted from only these other characteristics. The gap between the two sets of bars in this graph for each immigrant group measures segregation that can't be explained as due to differences in age or in marital status or in parenthood or in education or in income. There is definitely something else going on in these cities. But Bumadov's original question is still hanging out there unanswered. Now that we know that there definitely is considerable residential segregation in the Netherlands that is linked directly to ethnic identity itself, we still need to decide whether it is voluntary self-segregation or not. One of the questions in the 2002 survey of immigrants in the Netherlands asked, quote, imagine that you could select your own new neighbors. Would you rather want to live next door to co-ethnics, next door to Dutch, or would it not matter? Unquote. Turks were asked about living next door to Turks, Moroccans were asked about living next door to Moroccans, and so on. The native-born Dutch sample was asked whether they would want to live next door to other Dutch, next door to foreigners in general, or whether it just didn't matter. Based on the differences in actual living arrangements reviewed in the last part of the lecture, with the immigrants much more concentrated in co-ethnic neighborhoods than the Dutch, Bumadov is looking for a similar high level of preference for living with co-ethnics among the four immigrant groups. For example, remember from that previous figure that over half of all Turkish immigrants lived in neighborhoods with at least 30% ethnic minority populations. If such ethnic concentration is voluntary self-segregation based on personal preferences, then the Turkish immigrants should show a high level of preference for co-ethnic neighbors.
Without such personal preferences, we should probably think of this ethnic concentration as something imposed on the group by external forces. Before reviewing Bumadov's evidence and findings, we ought to recognize that the way these questions were asked may not give us exactly the kind of information we would like to have for answering Bumadov's question. After all, the survey question did not ask anything about the overall character of these neighborhoods where people lived. They also did not ask anything about whether people would like to be living in some different neighborhood in the city. For example, a survey might have used the show card technique that Bumadov describes as it was used in interviews of black and white respondents in the United States. There were five different cards to show a white respondent. The first card showed the respondent's house in the middle of a neighborhood in which all the other houses also had white residents. The second card had just one house with black residents. The third card had three black households. The fourth card had five out of 15 households, or one-third, with black residents, while just over half of all households in the fifth and final card had black residents. The white survey respondent had to pick the card that represented the neighborhood they would most like to live in. As you might imagine, hardly any white respondents ever chose the fourth or fifth cards. For black respondents, researchers chose a different mix of cards. This reflected the fact that the black population was much more familiar with living in highly segregated neighborhoods. The all-white neighborhood again was represented by one of the five cards, this time the fifth card instead of the first, lowest numbered one. In this way, higher numbers for a chosen card meant the same thing for both black and white respondents, more of a desire to live around people of a different race from your own. But the range of options for black respondents ran the full range from the all-white neighborhood at the high end to an all-black neighborhood in the first card. If the Dutch survey had used such measures, we would have information about the type of neighborhoods that people preferred, and not just a question about what kind of neighbors a respondent would like to have move in next door. One new neighbor does not really change the character of the neighborhood very much. The second figure presented in the article shows the responses of each group to the question about preferences for neighbors. Starting on the right side of the figure, we can see that about 40% of all native-born Dutch respondents said that they would prefer to have another Dutch family move in next door to them rather than a family of immigrants. This goes along well with the observed pattern that only about 10% of these Dutch respondents lived in neighborhoods with concentrated immigrant populations, while 90% lived in predominantly Dutch neighborhoods. So the native-born Dutch respondents apparently were actually living with the sort of neighbors they wanted, namely other native-born Dutch. However, the various ethnic groups of immigrants report a very different pattern of preferences for neighbors. For example, only about 8% of Turkish immigrants said that they preferred to live next door to other Turks. The share of Turks who said that they would prefer to have Dutch neighbors move in instead was actually almost twice as high as the percentage preferring Turkish neighbors. This pattern is the same for all the other considered ethnic populations. The percentage who wanted new neighbors of their own ethnicity was always in the single digits, and the share who actually, who actually preferred Dutch neighbors instead was always at least twice as high, sometimes even greater. The other interesting thing to notice about these immigrant groups is that the overwhelming majority, about 80%, really didn't have any ethnic preferences when it came to possible neighbors. This question of ethnicity just didn't seem to show up on their personal radar screens. This shows that neighborhoods with high ethnic concentrations were not highly desired places to live, even for the ethnic populations who were concentrated in them. Since these immigrant populations all included much higher proportions than for the native-born Dutch of people with low levels of education, low income, and other social and economic disadvantages, clearly visible in Table 3 in the article, the neighborhoods where they tended to settle were not generally the best parts of these cities. Most of the immigrants showed a strong preference not to live only with people from their own ethnic group, and more of them who expressed an actual preference chose Dutch neighbors instead. A related detail about these immigrant attitudes emerges from the more detailed results in Tables 4 and 5 of the article and in Bumadov's discussion of those results.
She points out that when we consider the family circumstances of respondents, we see a very significant pattern among native-born Dutch respondents. The Dutch, who are married and living with children, are much more likely to express a preference for Dutch neighbors, while people living without partners or children appear less concerned about flocking together with other Dutch. In contrast to this result, immigrants, particularly from Turkey and Morocco, were actually less likely to prefer co-ethnic neighbors if they were married and had children. They apparently wanted their children to experience the benefits of regular Dutch neighbors and neighborhoods. The conclusion to be drawn from these results seems clear to Wenda Bumadoff, and perhaps it also seems clear to you. The concentration of ethnic immigrants into certain segregated neighborhoods in these four Dutch cities can't be explained by the expressed preferences of the immigrants themselves to live with their own kind. If they could have their way in terms of preferences, they clearly would be living close to a lot more Dutch neighbors. Only a small part of this concentration in ethnic neighborhoods can be explained by other social and economic features of the immigrants' lives, such as their educational attainment, family status, or income. The only conclusion left is that the major part of this ethnic segregation in Dutch cities has been imposed on these immigrant groups by larger structural forces operating in the Netherlands, and that it is not voluntary but forced segregation in this sense. 